Well, let's grab our Bibles um, tonight, and um, <clears throat> I hope that you are praying for our fellow believers that are that are suffering. We've got a lot of people going through different things, and um, my wife was reminding me, uh, Mrs. Vargas is going in for surgery this week, Wednesday, I think it is. Uh, I'll be praying for her, and uh, just a lot of a lot of people suffering. Hope that you. On Wednesday night, get those prayer lists and pray over them because uh, there's a lot of folks going through a lot of things and a lot of, a lot of needy people. Um, lost folks need us to be praying for them. Our fellow Christians need us to be praying for them. And there's a whole lot of, whole lot of praying for all of us to do, and I hope that you are. But uh, Philippians chapter 1 tonight, Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> And we're just going to look at one verse. Of course, this is a, a powerful chapter from beginning to end. There's a, just a wealth of study here, uh, many things that we can spend time meditating on that, that uh, uh, can just transform our lives. But uh, we're just going to focus on one thing uh, tonight. Let's go ahead and stand, if you would, <clears throat> out of respect for the Word. And uh, we'll go ahead and read verse number 29 together. So Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 29. The Bible says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. And I want you to notice what God says here, what, what God's speaking through Paul to this church that was going through some difficulties. He says, Unto you it is given. And if you just skip down a little bit, because sometimes we can get lost in the train of thought. If we, don't, if we don't pay attention to the grammar here, all the words, of course, are important. But I want you to see that, that, non, that what, what all God has given us. All right, He says, unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ. <clears throat> and we, we see the believe on Him. All right, that's, that's a blessing that we can know Christ as our Savior. But notice what else is given, but also to suffer for His sake. Tonight, I want to talk about the gift of suffering. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And Lord, there are a number of people in our church suffering in so many different ways. And especially, Lord, we think of our pastor tonight. Please uh, give him just special grace uh, being sidelined in such a time, Lord, while we're preparing for this big day and everything, Lord. And I just pray Lord, please strengthen him, uh, give him grace through this whole ordeal, and please uh, give the doctors wisdom, but most of all, bring healing, raise him up that we might be with him here uh, together soon. Uh, but Lord, I, I just pray that as we look at this idea of suffering, that Lord, you'd help us all to have hearts that are willing to uh, learn and understand. Uh, Lord, help us to have a biblical perspective concerning suffering. Uh, Lord, that it would not surprise us when we suffer, uh, but rather it would be a tool that we would allow you to use. Lord, please speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I think pretty much everybody realizes that my, my wife has some health problems. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details about it, nothing that is considered life-threatening or anything, but... Uh, some suffering, and um, <clears throat> being with her as she has gone through all of these things um, has taught me some things about just being gracious to those that are suffering, uh, but also <clears throat> to, to stop and consider, you know, what, what, is, what is the point? What is the purpose? Uh, you know, God has a purpose for all things, and, and, and a purpose even for suffering. And so let's look at the scriptures tonight. We're going to look at a lot of verses. Uh, I encourage you to take notes uh, in preaching. I try to do that most of the time. Uh, some messages don't lend themselves well to notes, I think. But, uh, but I think if you have a pen and paper tonight, you may want to jot down some of these references so you can refer to them later. And uh, I think they'll be a blessing to you. But uh, to begin with, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 10 says, For it became him, talking about Jesus, for whom are all things, all right? Now, just, he's reminding us who he's talking about. Everything was made for Jesus. By whom are all things, all right? So everything was made by Jesus. Uh, but he says, in bringing many sons unto glory, all right, he picks up the thought again, it became him to what? 
uh, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now, Jesus, of course, was perfect uh, in his being and in his holiness uh, with, without the suffering. Uh, but through suffering, Jesus became a perfect Savior. And so suffering was an absolutely essential part of God's plan for you and I to be saved. Without it, we would still be on our way to hell. And so in trying to understand how suffering can be considered a gift, we must remember that suffering was God's means of achieving His purpose, even in His own Son, Jesus. And He likewise will use suffering in your life and my life today. James 1 and verse 3 says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let it patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now the idea there of trying your faith. Uh, our faith is tested often, and, and perhaps <clears throat> no more so than when we are suffering. As we are brought to a point where, man, it, we, we want to question, we want to even argue with God, why do I have to go through this? But he says, let, your, let patience have her perfect work. Trust God through the trial. 1 Peter 1 and verse 6 is, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor at the glory and glory, excuse me, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And so our faith is going to be tested, it's going to be purified, it's going to be put through the fires because it is more precious than gold. Now, before we can really understand how suffering can be a gift, we do need to stop for a moment and consider where suffering comes from. Because all self suffering is a result of sin. When Adam and Eve chose to listen to the counsel of Satan and eat of the forbidden fruit, they brought death and a curse upon all of God's creation. And so all sickness, all suffering, all death began at that time. And by the way, that's why somebody who takes the Bible seriously cannot accept the gap theory or the day-age theory of creation because that requires then that death would have to happen before Adam and that is simply impossible. Death did not come until after Adam sinned. Romans 5 and verse 12 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And so what we need to realize tonight is that we all will suffer. In fact, Jesus promised us that. And we all will die unless Jesus comes back and raptures us out of this earth. And it is the result of sin's deterioration and sin's curse upon our bodies. Now, having said that, all suffering is a result of sin. But not all suffering is a direct result of of a particular sin in the life of the individual suffering. All right, remember, <clears throat> the disciples asked Jesus, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, if you really think about that, it's kind of a dumb question. How could he sin and then be born blind? But anyway, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a chronological uh, confusion there in that question. But, <clears throat> but Jesus says, neither one. All right, he was born blind that the work of God can be perfected. Right? It was an opportunity for Jesus to heal him. And so all suffering is a result of sin, but not necessarily a result of the individual sin who is suffering. Some suffering is just a result of sin in general. The general curse and general deterioration of our bodies that we all have to endure, especially as we get older. And this is sometimes unpredictable and unexpected, uh, like oftentimes with cancer. Sometimes it can be traced to our genes that we received at conception. You know, certain, certain families are prone to certain problems. And so we need to realize that any time of healthy living on this sin-cursed world is an undeserved blessing. None of us deserve to be healthy. And so we ought not focus on why me and when bad things do happen to us. Because bad things are going to happen to everybody. Now, sadly, some suffering in this life is the result of 
other people's sins. All right, you think of uh, you know, a young boy that catches a, a stray bullet uh, from a drive-by shooting. You know, obviously, there was a direct sin involved, and there's a boy who is suffering who did nothing to deserve it. But somebody else's sin caused his suffering. Or when a rape victim has to undergo the difficulties of pregnancy and carry those emotional scars for the rest of their lives, uh, they bear the results of sin, not their sin, but somebody else's. Or when a careful and sober driver is hit by a drunk and killed, it obviously wasn't the result of their sin, it was the result of the drunkard's sin. Or when a Christian faces persecution, you know, Paul, sitting in prison as he wrote this, had done no wrong. <clears throat> and we will face suffering simply because we are Christians. But some suffering in this life is the result of our own sin. Some of our sin does bring natural consequences. Uh, if you want to turn with me for a moment, we'll turn to Deuteronomy 28. And we'll note this here <clears throat> as God warns His people. In Deuteronomy 28... And verse number 58, he says, If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful. Now catch that. He says, if you will not lift up God's name, if you will not observe the law, he says, God is going to make the plagues on you wonderful. And the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues and of long continuance, and sore sickness and of long continuance. Uh, he goes on, uh, Moreover, he'll bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt which thou was afraid of, and they will cleave unto thee also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law. Then will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. And so sin does bring consequences sometimes. And sin can bring illness upon us. Uh, and so here we have a warning to Israel as a nation. And any nation that will not take heed to walk in God's ways will find that it's true of them as well. Let's look at another passage in Psalm 107. Psalm 107 and verses 17 and following. <clears throat> Psalm 107 verse 17 The Bible says, fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. All right, so here we have foolish people <clears throat> that because of their iniquities, they're facing affliction. Verse 18, it goes on, it says, Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death, just describing how serious their affliction is. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and He saveth them out of their distresses. He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. And God is very gracious and merciful to us when we repent. But today there are many who are suffering the natural consequences of their sin. We're talking about those who maybe have contracted a, an STD because of their promiscuous lifestyle. We're talking about uh, uh, the AIDS epidemic amongst those that are living a sodomite lifestyle. Uh, we're talking about the liver and blood and kidney problems from drinking alcohol and, and lung and mouth and throat problems from tobacco. Uh, we're talking about worry and anxiety causing heart disease. There's a sin we don't like to admit is sin. The worry and anxiety of our hearts. We're talking about those who indulge in illegal drug use. Uh, I had the opportunity of working with a... Uh, uh, faith-based addictions program in our in our home church back before we started the church in Princeton, and it was sad. Um, you know, you, you meet somebody who's hooked on heroin, and uh, most of the time, that's a death sentence. Unless God <clears throat> really gets a hold of them, it's a death sentence. That stuff will kill, and it's the natural result <clears throat> of their sin. And so our physical health can be affected by our spiritual state. We do read that in Scripture, Proverbs 22, 8. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. So we sow iniquity, and then we reap vanity. Proverbs 17, 22, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Proverbs 14, 30, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, 
but envy the rottenness of the bones. And so our spiritual condition can affect us physically. And sometimes God just flat out brings divine judgment. Uh, of course, we could think of Haman in Esther, uh, <clears throat> you know, plotting against the people of God, and eventually he gets hung on his own gallows. We could think of Gehazi uh, <clears throat> getting, you know, giving in to his covetousness and, and then ends up with uh, that leprosy that, that, uh, <clears throat> that, that the general was healed of. Uh, we could think of Pharaoh losing his firstborn son in the plagues. We could think of Achan being stoned and burned. We could think of Uzzah uh, being smitten as he touched the ark. We could think of Miriam in Numbers 12. Storing up some rebellion to Moses and, and, and is, uh, uh, becomes leprous for a time. Ananias and Sapphira lied about what they gave. And so God took their life. Herod being lifted up in pride and receiving praise as if he were a god. And so God smote him. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and flip over there for a moment. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 27, we have this warning concerning the Lord's Supper. He says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So if we don't take the Lord's table seriously, he said we, we bring guilt upon ourselves. But then verse 20, he says, But let, let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now notice this. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now he's not talking about people dozing off in the sermon. All right, he's talking about people that had literally died because he did not take the Lord's table seriously. And so <clears throat> sin can bring great suffering into our lives. And truly all suffering is the result of sin. Now, so suffering is the result and consequence of sin, but we must never forget that God is in control. Now, <clears throat> I, I don't know a whole lot about what this church was like when this happened. Uh, there are not the kind of church we'd want to be a part of, but it is a, a Baptist church. Uh, and on September 15, 1999, uh, Larry Jean Ashbrook, some of you might remember that name, walked into Wedgwood Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas during a teen rally. He slammed his hand on the door to let people know that he was there and then began, began firing two handguns into the crowd while shouting anti-Christian and anti-Baptist comments. Finally, when one young man began to witness to him, he told the young man to shut up and then turned the gun on himself and shot himself in the head. Altogether, 14 people were shot and seven died. But you probably, if you heard that on the news, you probably didn't hear the rest of the story. Before the shooting, <clears throat> the pastor of the church had prayed that God would do whatever it took to expand the ministry of Wedgwood Baptist Church. Um, it was said that their church was a model of how not to pick a location. It was very hard to find. And now almost because of this tragedy, almost everybody in the world heard about that church. <clears throat> but that's not all. Uh, there was <clears throat> all kinds of evidences of God <clears throat> protecting and, and, and working even through this horrible tragedy. In order to enter the church, the gunman had to walk past the children's playground which should have been full of kids. But for some reason, every single child in every single preschool class was running late, and no one had made it to the playground yet. The uh, <clears throat> gunman fired over 100 bullets into a crowd of over 400 people, but only 14 people were hit. Now that's... <clears throat> if he was trying to hit people, that's amazing. <laughs> He also had over 60 bullets still on him when, when he shot himself. He had a pipe bomb that he threw, but the bomb, <clears throat> uh, the bottom of it fell out, and so it did not explode. One of the youth that, that was wounded uh, as she was yielding a disabled friend with her body uh, happened to have scoliosis. And the curve in her spine actually directed the bullet away from her major organs, 
saving her from serious injury. Because the first 911 call came in on a police radio, emergency vehicles were dispatched immediately without spending precious time uh, to verify that the call was real. One of the people in the church at the time was a paramedic, and he was able to stop bleeding and stabilize injured people before the emergency crews even arrived. Leaders were able to get, <clears throat> get the children out of the building without the kids having to see any of the victims or any of the mess. Each children's worker stayed with her, his or her class, even though they all had uh, children elsewhere in the building. That had to be hard. You know, if you, you got your kids down on the other side of the building, and, but you got this class to be responsible for. But each of the teachers did what they knew what was right and took care of their classes. <clears throat> Not one worker left their post, even though some of them had teens in the auditorium where the action was, was taking place. None of the adults who did die had children. All seven victims were not just Christians, but bold Christians who were passionate about their faith. And so they, it wasn't a tragedy in their minds, it was a graduation to glory. Now listen to what God did after the shooting. There was a church in Tulsa, Oklahoma that drove over five hours just so they could uh, march around the church and pray during the uh, next Sunday morning service. The Fort Worth uh, Police Department planted flowers in the flower beds before, uh, before the congregation could re-enter uh, the sanctuary to worship. Um, <clears throat> somebody writing on behalf of the church said, we received over 10,000 emails, 5,000 cards, and $60,000 from all over the world. The pastor, uh, during that time, had a microphone in his face almost continually uh, as over and over he gave outstanding answers uh, to a reason for their hope. Uh, he even presented the gospel beautifully on Larry King Live when prompted by a question uh, asked by Vice President Gore. Because of the live news coverage and interviews, over 200 million people heard the gospel because of the tragedy. 15,000 turned out for a community-wide service at TCU Football Stadium. And the, fo uh, the pastor gave a very serious, challenging message calling for a day of fasting and heart-searching. Monday, the service was broadcast in its entirety on a news station that covers most of North Texas. The same news station has replayed the pastor's first press conference due to people calling in and requesting to hear his comforting words again. CNN also broadcast a memorial service live. Amazingly, because one of the victim's families lives and works in Saudi Arabia, that country allowed the service to be broadcast there as well. Now think about that. In Saudi Arabia, it is, it is illegal to say the name of Jesus on the street. And yet they broadcast this, this, this service. Because of that same CNN broadcast, 35 people in Japan gave their lives to Christ. At several schools, students met around their flagpoles the next day at one school, 25 students accepted Christ and 110 at another. A teacher led 22 students to Christ in her classroom. Christian teachers all over North Texas have been able to share uh, with their classes because the students are asking questions about their teacher's faith. In Burleson, prayers and scripture are being said over the intercom. On the East Coast, where I see at the pole was delayed because of the hurricane, record numbers of kids showed up to pray. A caller to an area Christian radio station said that he didn't know what those people had, but he wanted it. Uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, the DJ proceeded to lead him to Christ over the air. Many notes left in front of the church contain the same sentiment. Those who don't know Jesus want what we have. The church has received so many emails asking us how we were able to, uh, to have hope and continue on. And there are, at least at this time when this was written, uh, there were teams of church members who were volunteering just to answer the emails. The person who wrote this report said, my friend Jody has been praying for her husband for years. She and their four-year-old daughter were at the church that night. And three days ago, Scott, the husband, gave his life to Christ. They said, we've had over 70,000 hits on our webpage, which displays the plan of salvation in multiple languages. Many members of Wedgwood Baptist are, are <clears throat> uh, healing broken relationships within the body and experiencing spiritual renewal. And these are just a few of the miracles that are happening. You see, God is in control. 
And God will use suffering and use difficulties and even tragedies for good. Uh, some of you probably know Bill Hardeck, our missionary to the Philippines. Uh, he wrote concerning this, our, our text in Philippians, God triumphs over our sufferings by using it as a tool to accomplish his will in our lives. Now think about some of the scriptural examples. Joseph was thrown into a pit and sold by his brothers into slavery, eventually falsely accused and imprisoned. And yet he could say, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. And the same God that watched over Joseph will watch over your life and mine. Pharaoh had Israel trapped by the Red Sea. But then the next chapter, we read Israel singing a song of praise and victory. Why? Because the whole army was destroyed in the sea. John chapter 9, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. You see, sometimes God allows difficulties and tragedies so that we can just see him work through it. You see, Paul knew what he was talking about. It was through suffering that he saw the Philippian jailer get saved when the church was established there to begin with. And now as he's in Rome and writing back to that church, God uses Paul to give us another illustration of his providence that through Paul's imprisonment, he was actually able to reach people that he would not have been able to reach otherwise. He was able to reach people from Caesar's household. He was able to reach soldiers that were guarding him there. People that he probably would never have reached otherwise. You know, I was uh, encouraged and challenged uh, the other day when I was talking with a pastor at the hospital. He said, man, God's just given me all kinds of opportunities to witness. He said, I've just been witnessing like crazy. And, uh, and, and even tonight, he mentioned how people have been asking about the church. Say, wow, your church really impressed us with so many people coming to see you and all that. And, uh, uh, and, and that's, what, that's what suffering is. It's an opportunity for God to work. Many of you know Pastor Courtney Lewis, a good friend of mine. Uh, he said one time, when I see a Christian going through trial or tragedy, I always think God must have something special for them. And that's what we ought to think. We ought not think like Job's friends, oh, what did you do to get yourself into so much trouble? No, <clears throat> I was thinking, wow, God's got a blessing for you. Mrs. Uh, Charles Cowman uh, compiled several devotional books. They're just a real blessing. She was a missionary wife. Her husband died on the field. But, uh, but she shares this, this quote, that the very fact of trial proves that there's something in us very precious to our Lord. Else he would not spend so much pains and time on us. Christ would not test us if he did not see that precious ore of faith mingled in the rocky matrix of our nature. And it is to bring this out into purity and beauty that he forces us through the fiery ordeal. Now tonight I want you to notice several purposes that God will use suffering for. Number one, and we've hinted at this already a little bit, but God will sometimes use suffering to chasten us. To chasten us for sin that we need to deal with, but we haven't dealt with. And we saw a little bit of that in 1 Corinthians 11. But in verse 31, he says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And so if we are seeking out the sin in our lives to remove it and repent of it, uh, we'll save ourselves some pain. But sometimes God has to use some difficulties to get our attention, to get us to stop and think, to get us to consider is my heart right with God? Psalm 119, verse 67, David recognized this. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I've kept thy word. He said, I started to wander off, but God sent some affliction into my, lives and, into my life, and now I'm keeping his word. And we need to respond to suffering the same way. 
But sometimes suffering is brought into our lives to prevent sin. Uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. This really is an amazing text if we really stop to ponder it. Paul says here in, in, in just, uh, again, an amazing uh, <clears throat> self-revelation. You know, he's just being very honest with us here. And uh, shares with us some of God's dealings with him as an individual. And, and it's very instructive. He says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. So he already tells us why this happened. He said, God was worried I was going to get proud. You know, and Paul was greatly used of God. Paul received many revelations from God and wrote much of, uh, much of the New Testament down. Uh, and, and we get proud about, you know, hey, I had a visitor Sunday. You know, uh, it, it's, easy, uh, it's easy to fall into that trap of pride, isn't it? And so Paul says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Now imagine this. Paul, this great prayer warrior, and, and he prays three times. Now, I, don't think, I don't think that means he just said, Lord, please take it away. Lord, please take it away. Lord, you know, it wasn't <clears throat> something flippant here. It means he, he had three specific times where he spent some serious time with God saying, Oh God, please take this away. I really believe I could serve you better if this was gone. Now we didn't know for sure what this thorn in the flesh was. Some think it might have been a, uh, an annoying Christian. <laughs> uh, some people think it might have been a health problem, a problem with his eyes, something like that. Uh, and there's evidences of that in, in Scripture. But we don't really know for sure. What we do know is it was something that he felt he'd be better off without it. And so three times he went to God and seriously prayed about it. And God said to him in verse 9, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so once Paul realized that God's strength will be made perfect in his weakness, then he could say, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, to glory in our infirmities, if, if I were to put that in just simple terms for us to understand, he's saying, I'm going to get excited about my problems. I'm going to get excited about my weaknesses. I'm going to get excited about not having enough money. <laughs> because he knows that when he's at the end of his rope, as it were, when, when he's at the end of his own strength, then God's strength can work in and through him. And so it prevented him becoming proud because he learned he must depend upon God. You see, we need to realize that sin is worse than any suffering we might go through in this life. We need to look at it that way, that sin is worse. That if we're faced with a choice of going through pain or sinning, we ought to choose the pain. Because God in His grace knows that that would be better for us. And so sometimes suffering is to prevent us from sin. Thirdly, sometimes our suffering is to reveal our true character. Probably no better place to learn about that than from Job. And so let's turn back there, if you would, for a moment. We'll just look at a couple verses. <clears throat> Job chapter 1 and verse 21. Job 1 and verse 21. This is right after he has lost everything, his material wealth, most of his family. <clears throat> and in Job 1, in verse 21, he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now what does that reveal to us about Job? It reveals that Job was the kind of guy who realized he doesn't deserve anything. He was humble. He realized that everything he had was just a gift on loan from God. Turn with me over to Job 23. This, to me, I think is probably one of the key passages of the book of Job. And we won't read the whole chapter, but we'll just look at verse number 10. He says, But he knoweth the way that I take. 
Right? Job didn't lose sight of the fact that God was still in control. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed thy word, the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You see, the trial Job went to just revealed his character. That he was committed to be faithful to God, that he loved God's word, and it brought that out. <clears throat> and sometimes God will allow us to go through suffering because it's then that people around us can begin to see Christ in us. It's to reveal our true character. You think about even Jesus as he suffered on the cross, and we won't turn there, but in Luke 23, you'll find that <clears throat> there were more than one witness that said he's, he's innocent. Truly, he is the Son of God, and so on. Because they watched how he suffered. It wasn't like a criminal suffers. But number four, <clears throat> suffering also is used by God to shape our character. In Hebrews 12 and verse number five, <clears throat> Paul is writing again to encourage some that were beginning to backslide. He said, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh on you as in the children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. God does correct us. Don't give up and quit when he corrects you. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. If God doesn't correct us, it's because we're not one of his children. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily, talking about our, our earthly parents, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But He, God the Father, He chastens us for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. You see, God will use suffering to shape and mold our character so that we can be partakers of His holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, right? We don't like pain, right? We're not talking about some crazy mental illness here, all right? <clears throat> it's, it's not joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You see, the suffering is worth it in the end when God uses it to make us like Christ. Puritan William Bridge said, Suffering times are teaching times. Romans 5 and verse 3, Paul said, And not only so, but we also glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. You see, it's through our trials that we develop that Christ-like patience so that we can bring glory to God through our weakness. It's in our trials that the fruits of the Spirit will be produced. You're not going to learn how to be patient until you have to put up with something for a long time. And that's a fruit of the Spirit, but it's something God has to put us into that, that, that place of testing before it will be seen. It's been estimated that a bar of steel that's worth $5, if you work it into horseshoes, it'll be worth $10. If you make it into needles, <clears throat> it'll be worth $350. If you make it into penknife blades, it'll be worth $32,000. If you make it into springs that you would use in watches, it'll be worth $250,000. Now imagine the different processes that, that go through <clears throat> between a, a horseshoe and, and producing one of those springs. There's a lot more drilling that that bar has to go through in order to be worth a whole lot more. <clears throat> and God puts value into our lives through our sufferings. Isaiah 41, 15, he says of his people, Behold, I will make thee a new sharp thresh threshing instrument. 
Right? How's he going to do that? How's he going to turn us into a threshing instrument? It's going to be putting us through the fire, heating up the metal, banging away, you know, <clears throat> then sharpening it on the, on the wet stone. It is, it's through suffering that God does this. Number five, God will use suffering to test our, our I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards, aren't I? No, I'm not. Sorry, to test our faith. Uh, we're going to go back to Job again real quick. That's why I thought we are going backwards because we are already in Job. Uh, but Job 2 and verse 9, all right, <clears throat> uh, suffering not only brought forth uh, <clears throat> showing the kind of man Job was, uh, but it also uh, tested his faith so that we could see why he could say the things he said. All right? it, it showed what was deep down inside. It was his faith. In Job 2 and verse 9, uh, he says, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. All right, wives, please do not make that your memory verse. All right, don't, don't, don't say that to your husband ever. All right, verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. Uh, man, I won't tell you not to use that phrase. It's a fun one. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> All right, I'm teasing. But, uh, but what shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all of this did not Job sin with his lips. Again, we see that it wasn't just, it wasn't just some Spartan, you know, uh, saying, well, I'm just going to be strong and go through it. No, it was, it, Job was trusting God. Uh, Job uh, chapter 13 and verse 15. Again, he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That was his heart. But I'll maintain my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. He said, I honestly am just trusting in God no matter what. Number six, suffering, God will use it to draw us closer to God. All right, we mentioned Romans 5 already, but turn with me to Romans 5. This is such a powerful verse here. Romans chapter 5 and verses 3 and 5 or 3 through 5 <clears throat> these are verses that I would often use in counseling those that are going through trials to try to encourage them uh, <clears throat> again powerful verses verse 3 says not only so but we glory in tribulation also knowing that tribulation worketh patience all right we saw that verse already but verse 4 he says in patience produces experience and experience produces hope. Okay? Now, catch verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now notice this. He says the hope that we have does not leave us ashamed. Why? <clears throat> because when we go through those trials and temptations, those tribulations that he mentioned in verse number 3, it is an opportunity for God to shed abroad in our hearts the Holy Ghost and His love. In other words, if I can put it practically, our trials are a time for God to love on us. Man, it's through those difficult times that, that you just fall on your knees and it's almost like God reaches down and gives you a hug. He's right there with you. It's a wonderful opportunity. Spurgeon said, the spade of trouble digs the reservoir deeper and makes more room for consolation. In Job 42, remember what Job said at the end. He said, I have heard thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I bore myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job was a good man before, but after his suffering, he said, I see him. He was much closer to God. And God will use our trials to draw us closer to Him. Puritan Stephen Charnock said, We learn more of God under the rod that strikes us than under the staff that comforts us. Psalm 119, verse 71, again, David said, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Another Puritan, Thomas Goodwin, said, So what if God takes away more of the world from you than others? If He gives you more of Himself, than others. Amen. Then number seven, God will use suffering to enhance our ministry. If you go back and think about Paul again in 2 Corinthians 12, when God says, my grace is sufficient for thee, what did that mean? It means that God was sending him his power, that because Paul was weak and needed to depend upon God, that made it possible for him to do more ministry. 
And so his suffering actually enhanced his ministry. In Galatians chapter 4 and verses 13 through 15, again, we won't turn there right now, but you'll find that, that Paul kind of got stuck in Galatia for a while because of his physical infirmity. And so it, 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 it endeared him to the people and opened doors that might not have been opened otherwise. And God will do the same in your life. You might want to ask, why do I have to go through this? But maybe it's so you can be a better instrument in God's hands. Romans 12 and verse 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. And it's a lot easier to weep with somebody who's going through something that you've already been through. You can have a whole lot more compassion if you've been there. Spurgeon again says, Studying the lives of eminent men, we come to the conclusion that on the whole, it is good for a man to bear the yoke. Good for a man to <clears throat> breast the billows, as it were. Good for a man to pass through the fire and through the water and so learn sublime lessons. Even when the reason that God has allowed suffering in our lives is not apparent, we do know Romans 8, 28 and 29, don't we? We looked at it this morning. All things work together for good, them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. And then he tells us what, he, what that good thing is he's accomplishing. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. And so God will use everything, all the suffering, all the difficulties, to make us more like Christ. Again, David said in Psalm 119 and verse 75, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. And when we're honest with God, when we've come through the trial, we can look back and say, Lord, I know that you're faithful, and you've got a reason for this. And I might not understand all the reasons, and I may never fully understand all the reasons, but God has reasons, and they are for our good. Verse 107 says, I'm afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. And when we're faced with those trials, there's nothing wrong with seeking his help and his grace. Because he promises that. And that's what he desires during those trials. And so there's no room for grumbling in the Christian life. Because grumbling is ultimately our way of glossing over the stark truth of what we really believe about God. When we start to grumble, it's because we don't think God's coming through for us. We don't think that God is giving us what we deserve out of life. God sentenced an entire generation except for Caleb and Joshua to die off in the wilderness because of their grumbling spirits. And their grumbling spirits revealed what they really thought about God's character. Instead of bringing their concerns to Moses and sharing their frustrations or their anger with him, uh, the people allowed their feelings to, to, to ferment and to affect their attitude towards God. You see, when we're faced with these trials and we don't know why and, and, we, and we, uh, we wonder you know, what's going to happen in the future, the proper response is not to get mad, not to get discouraged, not to get down in the dumps, but to draw nigh unto God. The people of Israel began to complain and took on an attitude that said the task is too big and God is not in control of these circumstances. Oh, I hope we as Christians have better faith than that. <clears throat> Let me close with this <clears throat> idea. When thou passest through the waters, deep the waves may be and cold. But Jehovah is our refuge, and His promise is our hold. For the Lord Himself has said it, He the faithful God and true, when thou comest to the waters, thou shalt not go down, but through. Seas of sorrow, seas of trial, bitterest anguish, fiercest pain, rolling surges of temptation, sweeping over heart and brain, they shall never overflow us, for we know His word is true. All His waves and all His billows He will lead us safely through. Threatening breakers of destruction, doubts insidious undertow, shall not sink us, shall not drag us out to ocean depths of woe, for His promise shall sustain us.
Praise the Lord whose word is true. We shall not go down or under, for he saith, Thou passest through. Flowers will often close and be trampled by heavy rains. But after the night passes and the sun shines its warm rays on the feeble flower, it will lift up its head and display its glory again. And so likewise, we must be strengthened by God's word and by prayer, receive of him that same grace that was sufficient for Paul so that we can make the most of our sufferings and difficulties. Because they are tools that God is trying to use. Let's go ahead and if it's about a nice close tonight. <clears throat>